Morning, church. Revelation chapter 7. If you have a Bible or a device by which to access the scriptures, I want to encourage you to open it up and turn to that chapter. Um, we're in a teaching series that we've entitled Jesus Full of Mercy and Justice. And it's our hope, it's our intention this morning to cover the seventh chapter in its entirety. You know, it's often been said that Revelation is a difficult book to understand. And I 100% agree with you, if you resonate in that sense, if you don't realize that the book does come with what's often been called its own divine outline. Without some sense of clarity as to what's being presented before us, it is very difficult to understand. And that's kind of true with most things in life. I mean, without some sense of clarity, like those kids, like what, what about church? Why are we doing it? What do we do when we get there? Without some sense of clarity of, well, who's this about? What is this about? How do you get engaged with it? You can be completely lost. Like, let me ask you a question. Who here among us knows how to operate one of these right here? You may look at that and go, well, it kind of looks like an engine. Well, this is actually called the Super Veloche Flat Six Espresso Maker. <laughs> That's an espresso machine. I have no idea how one would operate something like that. Now, there may be some among us who know how to operate something like this. This next slide, a military drone. This is known as the Global Hawk can fly at an altitude of 55,000 feet and stay in flight for 30 hours. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you know how to operate that. That might be something that we, we keep on the down low. I'm not sure, but um, there's other things in life that don't necessarily come with instructions and you wish that they did, like maybe some of these types of things, right? <laughs> like for me, I have six of those and I would say this, I'm thankful that I don't have six of these because I only have one of these and I have found, like for me, everyone's different. For some reason for me, six humans, I can get my head wrapped around that, but one golden doodle puppy is powerful for me. Um, not everything in life comes with instructions, a guide, an outline, a sense of clarity of what to do and how to do it and when to do it, but this is what I would say. I do believe the book of Revelation does. Revelation chapter one, verse 19, John is told this, write the things you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. And, and this kind of divine outline of the book of Revelation helps this book unfold to us with some sense of clarity. Chapter one, those are the things that John saw. Well, what did John see? He saw the person of Jesus resurrected in authority, in power, in glory, revealed. And it was a big deal. All of heaven is focused upon what John saw. They're in that first chapter. Those are the things that John saw. And then chapters two and three, the things that were at the time that John was writing, the people of Jesus, the seven churches. And then from chapter four on through the end of the book, the things which will take place. And for us, we saw chapters four and five really to be picturesque of what I believe Jesus rapturing his church and clarity that the father and son are seated in authority and power. And everything around those chapters would say, this is a good thing. It's, they're, they're reigning in all honor and glory and power. And then in chapter six through chapters 19, we begin to see God, a God of justice and a God of mercy, pouring out his judgment upon a Christ-rejecting world. You know, the Old Testament spoke a lot of this. And you'll see phrases like the day of the Lord in the Old Testament or the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, if you know your Bibles, is, was renamed Israel. So, so why this tribulation? Chapter six through chapters 19, what's happening here? Why this judgment? You know, I didn't come up with this description, but I resonated with it. 
I thought I'd share it with you. I heard it this week. One of the purposes for this season that is yet to come, this series that we're in that's futuristic, one of the reasons is to wake up a nation, the nation of Israel. Another reason is to shake up a people, those who don't yet believe, who who are kind of living life by their own values, by their truth, by what culture will accept. And that's what we see in the series and in the season that we're in together. These chapters, chapters 6 through 19, we see Jesus full of mercy and justice waking up the nation of Israel and shaking up a Christ-rejecting world. See, I think you need to be reminded of that kind of clarity or else it, it starts to get a little fuzzy as to what we're looking at in these chapters as we're just taking one chapter a week through this series. Last week, how many of you guys were here or saw it online? Okay. I believe we saw the evidence of God's justice. Would you agree? Yeah, the three of you that said, yeah, I was here and I kind of, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what, well, let me remind you what we saw. We saw judgment. We saw the Antichrist, we saw war, economic ruin, famine, death, brought by what's known as the four horsemen. It's all natural disaster. There's a great earthquake that's recorded for us here that shakes the earth to such a degree that the atmosphere changes. It affects the sun, the moon, the sky, the land, the sea. And many, many who who are kind of being woken and, and choken, is that a word? Shaken, shaken, we'll go with it. Many of those who are realizing that there's a God during this time surrender their lives to Jesus and they're martyred. And at the very end of that chapter, it kind of sets the stage for where we are this morning. Chapter six, I'll put it up for you on the screen. This is how it ends. Verse 15, everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, every slave, every free person, All, everyone hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks and said, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and the wrath of the lamb. And listen to this question they ask in verse 17. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to survive? Chapter seven is a response to that question in chapter six. What question? For great is the day of the wrath that's come and who is able to stand? You see, God in his mercy, listen, tune into this. God in his mercy is not done with the nation of Israel. He has made promises to his people that he will make good on. Nor, even after that time of rapture, is God done with those who are not Jews, what often the Bible would describe as Gentiles. And here's what we'll see this morning in chapter 7. We'll see God waking up Israel and shaking up the Gentiles to salvation. See, this chapter, if chapter 6 evidences the justice of God, well, chapter 7 evidences his mercy. And this morning we'll see that chapter seven is kind of a, almost like a pause or a calm from the judgment as angel are presented in this chapter. And one specific angel seals God's people, Israel, from judgment. And there's this massive gathering in heaven of of Jew and Gentile and every nation, every language is represented, worshiping God because of his justice, because of his mercy. So let's jump into the text. Let's look first at the first three verses of Revelation chapter seven. Reading from the New Living Translation, this is what it says. Then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even on any tree. And I saw another angel coming up from the east, carrying the seal of the living God. 
And he shouted to those four angels who had been given power to harm land and sea. Wait, he says, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God on the foreheads of his servants. Interesting section of scripture. Now, our area is no stranger to the power of water nor the power of wind. I don't know if you saw this, which happened just this week in Destin, this water spout that arose in the Gulf of Mexico. It's amazing what wind can do, both positively and negatively. And John writes here that these four angels are at the four corners of the earth. And so every single flat earth theorist goes, yes, there's my verse right there, right? <laughs> No, this is just like, this is just descriptive language. This is not a proof text for flat earth, but it's just everyday language to describe, listen, the whole earth is kind of under the authority of these angels and they're holding back the wind. What does this mean? These, these four winds. Are they winds like what we see in, in Destin this week to, to cause destruction like a water spout? Or are, they, are they just kind of holding them back as maybe an owner of a large dog is trying to hold back a dog from something or some person walking by? Or are, are these winds positive? You know, you can go to the beach on a summer's night here on the Gulf Coast, and on just that right setting, you can kind of feel that breeze from the Gulf. And it's just refreshing. We feel like, oh man, this is so good. You see, wind, by, by just holding back wind in general, there would be tremendous repercussions for the earth. For one, air pollution would hang over every city. But number two, evaporated water from any kind of body of water would simply rise into the atmosphere and remain there producing a worldwide drought with no rain. Listen, we don't know if, if what's happening in this section is that the angels are just holding back these destructive water spout winds or they're just holding back the wind in general. But what we do know is that chapter seven is somewhat of a pause between these sixth and seventh seals that we saw in chapter six. And we see that God uses his angels as representatives of his will, and that there's order and authority amongst these ranks of the angels. And as an angel carries God's seal, he calls to these four others to pause so he can place the seal of God upon his people. Now, what does this mean, this seal? See, in scripture, a seal indicates ownership and protection. Listen, if you're a believer here this morning, God's seal is upon you. You say, what do you mean by that? The book of Ephesians chapter one, starting in verse 13, this is what Paul writes to the early Christians. He says, in him, you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until re the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. You see, the Holy Spirit in our lives today is the seal and the guarantee that we belong to God. It's not like when you become a Christian that you're just left on your own to discern and to decide how to follow the will of God. But the seal of God's spirit upon us as believers leads to fruitfulness and change in our lives by his Holy Spirit. See, that's the wonderful thing about Christianity. It's not about getting right from the outside in, it's allowing God's spirit from the inside to begin to change you on the outside. And God's seal is significant of his ownership, of his protection. And this is truly an act of mercy from God. See, God isn't obligated to save or protect us now. I mean, sometimes if, you, if you've grown up in the 20th or 21st century, which if you don't realize, that's all of us sitting in this room, it's easy to fall into a sense of entitlement. Of like, do you know where I'm from or who I, like, I'm owed. 
Yeah, some people know this. But here's the interesting thing. God isn't obligated. But because of his love, his grace, his mercy, he extends his protection, his ownership, his sonship or daughtership. He calls us constantly to know him. Because I want you to know this. God is a merciful God. God is a holy God. God is a God that only God could be one who is full completely of justice and mercy because of what Jesus did on the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Why is that promise given? Because apart from Jesus, you and I are under the penalty of our sin. Because of God's love, his grace, his mercy, he satisfies his holy requirements in his perfect son who took your place and mine. Someone once said the cross of Jesus Christ is where mercy and justice kiss. It's where they come together and it's the only place they come together in perfection. It's in Jesus that we find, oh, I'm owned by God, I'm protected by God. Now, this seal here in Revelation is interesting because it's kind of in contrast to something that we'll see later in the book. Anyone ever heard of the mark of the beast? Yeah. This sense of identity of individuals that will say, listen, I'm buying into the economic, the political, the, the military strength of this one world leader and I want everything he's got. Seal me with that guy. The world's crazy. This guy seems to have an answer. I want to go there. W would you not resonate that the world seems to be primed for someone like that? The world's just chaotic. And often what we worship most is comfort and ease over character and values. And it'll be such a temptation to say, yeah, I want my family safe. I want my family provided for. These are good things. And if this one world leader can do it for us, I'm with him. This seal of God is in contrast to this seal that we'll see in Revelation 13 that is known as the mark of the beast. Well, who is being sealed? Why? Look at verse four. John writes, and I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. He actually gives a number. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. There's a definitive number, 144,000. There's a definitive group from all the tribes of Israel. Pop quiz, how many tribes are there of Israel? 12, you guys got it, because you did 12 and 12. You know that, even if you didn't know, you're mathematicians, you got it. 12 tribes with 12,000 apiece. So listen, here's just a side note. If you ever have someone come to you and say that they're a part of that 144,000, ask them to show you their seal and their tribe, because that's what John defines for us here as the individuals that would have that. And then he gets extremely specific. Look at verses five through eight. From Judah, 12,000. From Reuben, 12,000. From Gad, 12,000. From Asher, 12,000. From Naphtali, 12,000. From Manasseh, 12,000. From Simeon, 12,000. From Levi, how many do you think? 12, Issachar? 12, Zebulun? 12, yep. From Joseph, 12,000. From Benjamin, 12,000. 12,000 from each tribe for 144,000 that are marked with a seal. Now, I want to ask three questions about this to bring some clarity to what's being said here. Here's the first question. Why are these tribes from Israel a priority here? I mean, if you're just reading through the book of Revelation, chapter one, you're like, okay, I see Jesus. He's in authority. He's in power. I see that he loves his people. Chapters two and three. See, there's this scene in heaven, chapters four and five. And now I see judgment being poured out. Okay, wait a second. 144,000. This is extremely clear. It seems to be a bit of priority. That's a lot of ink of scripture to give to this time. Why? Listen, you and I recognize that the Bible is for us, but not necessarily all about us. That is an important concept to own in your study of scripture. Say, what do you mean by that? 
Zechariah 12, Romans chapter 11, tell us that there will be a future repentance in which one day blinders from Israel will be removed and repentance will come to the nation of Israel. See, these 144,000 of the Jews seem to be a sort of first fruits of all those prophecies from the Old Testament, that, that which Paul talked about in Romans chapter 11. So you need to know this. God is not done with the nation of Israel. He loves his people. He, he will fulfill the promises that he's given to them. And many have said that the nation of Israel often acts as a timepiece for that which God is yet to do in the world. I say, okay, I can see that, that God has a love for his people. He's made promises to his people. This is kind of some of those first fruits of the redemption of his people. But if you're like a, I don't know, maybe you could call it like a student of scripture, you may notice something interesting about the way these tribes are listed. It's different from any other way in scripture that the 12 tribes of Israel are ever described. And you may say, okay, is there something there? Is this some kind of like code to scripture so I can figure something out about what's to come? Well, listen, the, the tribes of Dan and Ephraim are, are not mentioned here. And, and interestingly, the tribe of Joseph, which is never spoken of this way, and Levi, if, you, if you've been walking through the uh, Daily in the Word program with us Monday through Friday, and we're kind of going through those Old Testament books, you may remember they were not given an inheritance of land because those were the individuals that God took care of because they served his people, but they're here. Why? Now I'm speaking to like the four people that picked up on this, but listen, some Bible commentators and scholars say that Old Testament books like Hosea, the book of 1 Kings, they record for us that these tribes, Dan and Ephraim, they were guilty of idolatry, that they kind of led some of God's people away. And so here we see that this is maybe some sort of disqualifying dynamic from them, okay? Some would say the false prophet that's spoken of in chapter five of the book of Revelation, well, he's from Dan. And so that's why these tribes are not mentioned. Honestly, we don't know. Who knows why these tribes are not mentioned? But I want to pause here for a moment because I think it's extremely important. There's something to that fact right there. We don't know. That's both important and freeing. As we approach the book of Revelation, listen, as you approach your walk with the Lord, you need to remember and recognize that you're speaking of God. God. And you and I, whether we like it or not, are on kind of a need to know basis with God. Have you ever experienced that? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Often he gives us what we need in his eyes, not our own. Our lives are to be lives of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this, for we walk by Facebook's news. No, <laughs> we walk by faith and not by sight. Why, why do I share that the, for, at this point? I really do think it's paramount to remember. In this study, the study of the book of Revelation, but also in your walk with the Lord, in Revelation, we see that Jesus loves his church, first five chapters. We see that Jesus is full of mercy and justice, and in chapters 20 through 22, we see that Jesus wins. That's what we know. Now, how are all the details gonna come together? Trust him, walk by faith, ha have a sense of humility. You know, it's interesting to me that some of the individuals that would have known the Old Testament the best missed the first coming of Jesus. I don't know that they walked by faith as much as they walked by their own prowess, their own abilities, their pedigree, their background, what they knew. And isn't it interesting? Those that knew the book better than anybody totally missed the first coming of Jesus. What's the purpose of this study? 
is to lead us to a place where we love Jesus, where we trust him, where we see him in, as he truly is resurrected in authority and power. And we know that even though there's chaos around us, God is working that together for good and for his glory. And we can trust him. We walk by faith. Why are these tribes mentioned this way? Listen, we don't know, but listen also this. In life's journey with the Lord, you need to know this. God is good. And God has given us his son, his word, his spirit, his, his people, his mission. That's what we know. And the details of how God's gonna work together, the intricacies of your life and the plan that he has for you. You're not called to figure out the plans of God. You're called to follow the person of Jesus Christ right where you are. See, may our lives be centered and wrapped around the truths of what we do know, not freaked out, frizzled and frazzled and frustrated by the truths we don't. Why are these names listed this way? I have a friend that says it this way, just to mess with us. I like that. <laughs> Why? Because God doesn't always fit in the boxes of our lives that we're most comfortable with. Does anyone resonate with that? Okay. Instead of seeking to fit him into a box, let's follow him with our lives. God will never, ever, ever go outside the contents and the context of his word. But it's okay sometimes to go, you know, I don't know about that, what the Lord has yet to do. I see what he says here, but I trust him. See, a God who never supersedes our will or our desires is no God at all. Last question about this 144,000. Why this seal? Judgment is gonna intensify during the tribulation. And these 144,000 are sealed, meaning they have divine protection from God, a protection from divine judgment, but also the attack of the Antichrist. Chapter seven and chapter 14 of this book seem to indicate that the purpose of these 144,000 is not just to have security so they can sit on a beach and go, man, have you heard how bad it's gotten out there? No, it's so that they could be set apart so they could reach people with the good news of Jesus. Don't you see some similarities to the seal that's upon your life and mine? And as they go about the mission that God has for them, they experience the protection that only God could bring. And kind of like our last question, like why are these names mentioned uniquely? I think there's some application for us this morning. One author put this, put it this way. In every age, God has had a faithful remnant. Elijah thought he was alone, but God had 7,000 who were yet faithful to him. The sealing described in Revelation 7 certainly has its background in Ezekiel, where the faithful were sealed before God's judgment fell. So while these 144,000 Jews are an elect people in the last days with a special task from God, they also symbolize God's faithful elect in every age of history. I like that. Another author said this, the scripture is full of examples of how God is able to keep those who belong to him safe in times of judgment, including Noah, Lot, Rahab, and the Israelites at the time of Egypt's 10 plagues. In the same way, God will protect these servants during the tribulation period, even as his judgment continues to fall. So what's the application for us? This is what I would say. I think the seal of God, what we see here for the 144,000 and for what we experience now, Ephesians chapter one, God's spirit is with us, should lend our lives to be lived with confidence, but also lives that are lived circumspectly. Say, so what do you mean by that? Ephesians 1.13, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Listen, I think there's some that are here this morning that need to be reminded that God's not done with you, that you're not alone, but that you have a good father. When Jesus was speaking of the good nature of our father God, I wanna read to you some of the words that he shared with people as they were wondering, does God care? Listen to these words of Jesus. He says, ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it'll be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. And listen to this illustration that Jesus gives. What man is there among you who if his son asks for bread, you say, here you go, kid, here's a stone. Or, or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? <laughs> if you then, being evil, meaning you're not completely perfect, you're not as God, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Christians, listen to me. What we see here in the book of Revelation, this 144,000 that are sealed with God's protection, God's identification upon their lives. Listen, let me see your eyes. You have God's seal upon you. His Holy Spirit has been given to you. He's your good, as Tomlin would say, good father, right? That should lend our lives to be lived in some sense with a bit of confidence, a bit of knowing that God is for me. He's not against me. The seal of God is upon my life and we can walk confidently in his love and in his care because your heavenly father has sealed you. But confident Christians aren't arrogant Christians. They also live circumspectly. So what does that mean? Walking circumspectly, you'll see that phrase throughout the New Testament from time to time. If you were to define it, one author puts it this way, to watch or look carefully how you live, to be vigilant and mindful of your behavior or to be on the lookout. Listen to how the New Testament describes this. Ephesians, Paul writes this, see then that you walk circumspectly not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. First Peter, he writes this, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Just because we're sealed doesn't mean we live stupid, right? Man, God's got me. I can just kind of go and do this and do that. And, and you look at his word and he goes, no, 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 no. Stay away from this. Stay away from that. Why? One of my mentors used to say, Neil, sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. It will destroy you. So you live lives of circumspectness. Is that another word? Shoke and circumspectness? Okay. A life of awareness. You have confidence. Listen, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. And also, stay alert. You, you have that great enemy, the devil, who's seeking to distract, who's seeking to depress, who's seeking to lead you to a place of self-focused living. I find this so interesting. Why is this seal placed upon these 144,000? Man, it identifies God's ownership, but also protection for the mission that they're to engage in. Go and preach the gospel. That, what we see in this scripture, I believe gives great insight into the description of why they were sealed. I mean, let's look at chapter seven, verses nine through 12. We're gonna see kind of the fruit of their lives, the fruit of their evangelistic ministry. The scene is heaven, but look at verse nine. John writes, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and they worshiped God. And look at verse 12. They begin singing. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. See, 
in this chapter, we not only see that there's a group that are sealed, but are the, there are those in heaven, this magnificent scene in heaven, a massive sea of people, from, from every corner of the earth, every people group, every language, standing before Jesus, clothed in white, palm branches in their hands. What does this mean? There's purity, there's victory, there's wholeness, there's celebration. The angels are there, the elders are there, the four living beasts, all these individuals that we read of earlier in the book, and they're worshiping God. And here's the question, what are they saying? Did you realize they're not saying anything? They're shouting and they're singing. Here's what they're shouting. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the lamb. They're owning that truth and they're singing joyfully, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever, amen. Now, John is witnessing all of this. He's new to the scene, right? If there is such a thing as a connect card, he's the guy filling it out that day, right? First time there. And you might think it'd be appropriate for him to say, what is going on here? What is this? Who are these people? Look at what happens in verse 13. One of the 24 elders asked me, who are these clothed in white? Where did they come from? And he said to him, sir, aren't you the one who knows? That's how I put it anyway. But then he said to me, these are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. John gets asked by one of these 24 elders, who, who are these people? And John says, you tell me. And the elder responds, these are those Christian martyrs who have come to know the Lord during this great time of judgment. One author puts it this way. Once God has sealed his 144,000, the whole world will hear his message. Multitudes will believe and be saved. The Antichrist and his false prophet will be furious and try to stop the revival by forcing new believers to turn away from the faith. They will deny people food and medicine. Executions will be frequent and numerous. And the number of martyrs will be more than any man can count. This is what's to come. And so in verse 15, this elder, the one of the 24, he explains it this way. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter for they will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun for the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd and he will lead them to springs of life-giving water. And God, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. These martyrs who faced unbelievable thirst, starvation, persecution, now they're being shepherded by Jesus. You know, chapter six, verse 17, it ends with this question. Great is this day of wrath. Who is able to stand? And chapter seven, it illuminates, it answers to us and for us this insight. Those who are able to stand this judgment from God are those who are sealed by God, the 144,000. God's ownership and protection is upon them. And those who are shepherded by Jesus will one day stand with him in the end. In the end, free from the pain and challenge of living in a fallen world and free from the sorrow and persecution that will come from a Christ-rejecting world. Now, all of this, all that we read here this morning, 
it fits and it flows within that divine outline from Revelation chapter one, verse 19. These are the things which will take place. Beginning in chapter six through chapters 19, we see these perspectives of, of what's going on on earth and what's going on in heaven. Man, we see justice and we see mercy. And, and God is pouring out his wrath and his judgment on a Christ-rejecting world. This is that great tribulation that's described there. To wake up a nation, to wake them up so that they can be sealed with the seal of God and to shake up a people, those who don't yet believe. So why? So they can be shepherded by him for eternity. See, there's insight for what's to come. This is what we see in Revelation chapter seven. But there's also application for us today. See, followers of Jesus, you are sealed and you are being shepherded right now. John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. It is so easy through just one Sunday to the next Sunday to kind of forget sometimes that God by his grace has sealed us and he shepherds us. There's challenges that arise. There's things that come that you didn't expect or anticipate. And it's easy to interpret the trials or the troubles or the challenges of life as indications of, oh, see, God hasn't sealed me. God's not shepherding me. Look at what's happening. No, no, no. God uses the challenges, the unexpected events, the situations that you didn't see coming as opportunities to develop our character, not to prove his lack of character. Trust him. His faithfulness will be shown. See, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. What we see here this morning in Revelation chapter seven is we see that this same God who now in this age of grace by his spirit seals those who belong to him and shepherds those, he'll do that same thing for those that turn to him during this horrific time of judgment. His mercy will still be seen. His mercy will still be seen. And listen, if you don't know the Lord, you need to know this. God wants a relationship with you. He wants you to know him, to experience the blessing and the life that comes from being sealed by him and shepherded by him. And it's so easy to come to know Jesus. Jesus did the difficult part. Dying in our place. Someone put it this way. It's almost as easy as the ABCs. Admit, admit that you're in someone that needs forgiveness and grace from God. Believe, believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. The one who is that good shepherd, the one who took our place, the one who rose again three days after being crucified to conquer sin, death, and the grave. Admit, believe, and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, if we've been introduced before, we've connected, you know that I'm a, well, someone put it this way. Neil, did you know that your shoes kind of match your shirt today? I said, yeah, I did. Like, I, I thought about this, that yeah, it's as easy as A, B, C, but it's also so much more. What about D, E, F, and G? You say, what do you mean? Man, you admit that Jesus is Savior. You believe and you confess, but then you know what? Salvation begins when you finally end in the sense of seeking to lead your own life. You die to yourself and you become what Jesus is looking for. Not someone who says, man, I, I, I want to avoid this. I want to get out of hell. I could experience some peace. Maybe Jesus, if he's dispensing that like a Pez dispenser, I'll get some of that. No. She says, man, I'm looking for someone to follow me as a disciple, to follow me. That's where life is found as a believer. And you know what you begin to experience? The forgiveness, the faithfulness of a good and gracious God. 
That's the lifestyle that God's calling you into, me into daily. Where we admit, man, I need Jesus. I believe in the promises of his word. I confess that what he says is true is true. And I die to myself. Man, I'm a disciple. I belong to him. And it's only through him that I can experience fruitfulness, his favor, his forgiveness, his goodness, his grace, his hand upon our lives because of his son, Jesus. 